Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 28 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mystery of Egypt's heretic pharaoh. I'm Dom Bethanelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So uh, we're talking about, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Egypt's heretic pharaoh. So 33 centuries ago, Egypt was ruled by the strangest king it ever had. He was the most unique individual ever to be pharaoh. Uh, And there were a lot of unique people who were pharaoh. Um, So this one stood above all the rest. He was driven by a powerful spiritual vision and overturned almost every aspect of Egyptian society. And some have even called him the first monotheist in history. So today on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, we're talking about the mystery of Egypt's heretic pharaoh. So who are we talking about here, Jimmy? What is this we're talking about? Well, um, we're talking about a pharaoh who he went by more than one name, and that's actually not unusual because pharaohs do actually they had like five major names that they that they had, mm. and they'd actually like other Egyptians keep their real name secret um, because in Egyptian society it was thought that if someone knew your real name, um, they could use it against you magically, they could manipulate you magically, and so uh, your mom knew your real name, but you had others that you, that everyone else called you. And um, one of the things about the goddess Isis, uh, a goddess of magic, was it, she, one of her titles was she who knows all the names. <laughs> um, so she could magically manipulate anybody. Um, but uh, to appreciate what happened uh, with this guy, uh, you ha- kind of have to understand what Egypt was like at the time. Um the heretic pharaoh was a member of the 18th dynasty, and that was when Egypt civilization was at its peak. The 18th dynasty, I mean, that's like really everything is going well. Um, it's it's part of, a, of an era that Egyptologists refer to as the New Kingdom. Now, this is 3,300 years ago. This is, you know, like, the 1300s BC. So from our perspective, this is a long time ago. But for Egypt, this is the new kingdom, (laughs) uh, as distinct from the old kingdom and the middle kingdom. By this point, Egyptian society has already been going for like 2000 years. um, And it's already risen. And that was the old kingdom, then it fell. And then it rose again. That was the middle kingdom, then it fell. Now it's risen for a third time. And that's the new kingdom. And uh, the 18th dynasty is is the peak of that period. Um, one of the things that Egyptians found is that there were certain institutions that really worked well for them. One of them was having a strong pharaoh. Um, also, uh, they had certain military policies and even even their art. You know, you notice that famous distinctive Egyptian art style. These were all cultural institutions that had been around for 1,700 to 2,000 years by this point. And what they found was whenever their civilization fell was when they got away from their institutions. Mm -hmm. And when they re-embraced them, they had success. And so that led Egypt to be a very conservative uh, nation. Uh, Some have said it's the most conservative nation in all history because it went back to those winning institutions every time and had success with them. So there's a lot of resistance to change in Egypt. That's in fact, and this is partly due to the environment in Egypt. You know, it's basically a desert Mm -hmm. during recorded history, except you've got this one little strip down the middle in the Nile Valley where it gets fertilized by the Nile River. So Um, It's a precarious environment, and Egyptians were very concerned about order and balance. And they even had a goddess named Ma'at, who was the goddess of order. And one of the big duties of every Egyptian was promoting Ma'at, promoting order in society. So it was very conservative. 
Uh, that's the reason that the art looks the same. I mean, you look at like European art from mm. centuries ago, it doesn't look anything like now. Right. You know, even over, you look at art from the 1500s. Now, 20th century art went crazy. But you look at art from the 1500s, it's different than the art in the year 1000, and that's different than the art in the year 500. But in Egypt, front to back, as soon as they established their artistic style, it lasted for thousands of years. They did not give artists a lot of freedom. They, it's like you're expected to portray the pharaoh this way. You get to use these kind of views, like, you know, the famous view where you kind of see him from the side. Um there's a classic pose that pharaohs are depicted in known as the smiting pose. And he'll have like um, the head of a foreigner in one hand, and then he's got a club raised in his other hand, and he's going to smite the foreigner. This is a symbol of the pharaoh's military conquests, because they had a culture that was kind of like the Goa'uld. <laughs> they didn't make everything for themselves. Instead, they raided other people. And so right. one of the things, because of their religion, which also was remarkably constant for thousands of years, their religion said, if you want to get into the afterlife, you need to be buried in Egypt. And that meant they never formed colonies mm. outside of Egypt because that no one wanted to die and be buried in some foreign land. So um, so what they would do is is they would go and like every spring or whatever, they would go on raids to neighboring territories and they would it was the pharaoh's job to lead the army into these other territories and you know smite the foreigners and then take back everything that's not nailed down and hmm. then extract tribute from them the next year and if they don't want to give you the tribute you reinvade again and this was how they got their money and this is how they became rich um, so, uh, so these are the institutions that work for them whenever they get away from them. It's a big problem. So around 1388 BC, <clears throat> a Pharaoh of the 18th dynasty named Amenhotep the third began to reign. Now, uh, like a lot of ancient peoples, they had what are called theophoric names. Uh, that means the name is based on the name of a God. And you see those in the Bible, like Daniel, Don E L. L means God, so Don E L means God is my judge. Okay. Um, whenever you see in a biblical name an L, like Michael, Michael, who is like God. Um, whenever you see an L or a Yah in an in a in a Hebrew name in the Bible, that's a reference to God. Okay. You even see see references to other gods like Merib Baal. Right. Well, that's the guy's name. He's named after the god Baal. Uh, and then because the Hebrews didn't like the god Baal, at least the Orthodox ones, um, that he sometimes got referred to as Meribosheth, Bosheth being the word for shame. So they've replaced the word Baal with the word shame. <laughs> okay. uh, well, you get the same kind of thing in Egypt. And so Amenhotep, anytime in Egyptian you see a hotep, that means is pleased. And so Amenhotep means Amun, the god Amun, is pleased. And, and that was also one of the jobs of the pharaohs was to please the gods. They were the chief priests. The, uh, the, the pharaoh was the pope of Egypt. So there were other priests, but the pharaoh is in charge of it all. So he's the head of the military, the head of the government, the head of the religion. He's the head of everything. And so he's also got all the power. Well, um, Amun, uh, who Amenhotep is named after, um, Amun was the chief deity in this period in Thebes. And uh, Amun is kind of interesting. He's uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of Egyptian gods have like animal heads and things like that. But uh, Amun is generally depicted as a human. And he he was conceived of as the hidden god or the invisible god. Hmm. And he uh, became identified uh, around the 1500s with Ra or Re, the sun god, and and eventually with other gods too. He's he kind of subsumed other gods into himself. At some point, he began to be identified with them. It's not like he ate them, <laughs> but it's it's like people said, "Oh, well, Re is really another aspect of Amun." 
Mm -hmm. And this other God, he's also really another aspect of Amu. And so he, that he, he that was part of his rise to being the, considered the chief God. Um, Amenhotep, being a pharaoh, had more than one wife. His chief wife was a woman named Tia. And so she was the chief queen. Uh, the two of them, and this is relevant because it's an early indication of what's going to happen. Amun wasn't the only god obviously. And mm -hmm. a god whose stock was kind of rising in popularity was named Aten. And uh, one of the indications that uh, Aten was becoming more popular is that um, Amenhotep III and Queen Tia had a pleasure barge that they would go sailing in. And the name of the pleasure barge was the Aten Gleams. And the reason that's an appropriate name for the boat is because the Aten was another solar deity that represented the solar disk. Okay. So you have Amun is identified with Ray, the sun god. Ray is also identified in sometimes with Horus. So you see a oh, falcon-headed figure. And then you've got the solar disk itself, the circle, which has rays coming out of it that sometimes have like little hands on the ends of the rays, like they're blessing or giving things to people. The sun hmm. is giving, the solar disk is giving things to people. And uh, so that's what Aten is. Now, um, Amenhotep is uh, a good pharaoh. He does things right. And unfortunately, his first son, Tutmos, dies. Uh, Tutmos, it's another theophoric name. Uh, the Tut part of it is a reference to the god Thoth, the god of magic, another mm -hmm. god of magic. Uh, and anytime you see a Mos, it's the same root as Moses. It means drawn out or born. Mm. So Thoth is born, or Thoth has caused a birth, or something like that. Okay. Um, so the son, Tutmos, who's the first son and should become Pharaoh, he dies. And that means a second son who was not planned to be Pharaoh gets moved into position to succeed. And his name is Amenhotep IV. So he's also he's named after dad. Amun is pleased. And Amenhotep IV, it's debated whether he had a co-regency with his father. Co-regencies were what were used when you were getting someone ready to take over. It was a way of grooming the new pharaoh, or it's a, it used in other countries, grooming the new king to get him ready to take over so that there will be a smooth transition. There won't be disputes about who's supposed to be the king now. And um, scholars have debated whether uh, whether Amenhotep III had a co-regency with Amenhotep IV, the recent evidence suggests that he did, and that it was about eight years long, that he was kind of incapacitated towards the end of his reign, among other reasons, because he had horrible dental problems. Huh. This was not uncommon in right. Egypt, uh, because they lived in a desert, and in deserts, you have sand, and sand you know, like Anakin Skywalker said, it gets everywhere, <laughs> including into the meal you're grinding to make your bread, which is the principal part of your diet. So Egyptians ate bread with sand in it. It's all these little bits of silica that would grind down their teeth as they aged and cause them horrible dental problems. And you look at the mummies of some of the pharaohs, and it's like, this guy must have just been incapacitated in pain for the final years of his reign. Hmm. And it seems that that may have played a role with Amenhotep III because his he had really bad dental problems. So uh, it looks like he did have Amenhotep IV serve a co-regency with him. So then Amenhotep uh, III dies. And at first, Amenhotep IV, he begins to reign solo uh, after his father's death around the year 1352 B.C., and at first, he's a conventional pharaoh. He does what's expected. He um, he completes his father's monuments that his father had started building, which is what a dutiful son would do. Um, he continues to have the names of the traditional gods inscribed on them. His own name is after a traditional god. He's Amun is pleased the fourth. And uh, he cares for his mother, Tia, in her declining years. So he's a, he's at first, he's a good pharaoh. And then around the fourth or fifth year of his reign, so this is around 1347, 
stuff starts changing. Hmm. He starts building new temples. Weird temples. Temples like have never been seen before in Egypt. And they're dedicated to the Aten. And um, they one of the differences of them, and we know this because we've got the, the building blocks of the temples. They got torn down later, but we've reconstructed them. This was in the 1950s. This was an early computer project called the Aten Temple Project, where they like mapped all of the individual blocks and then refitted them together based on, okay, this one's got a pharaoh's head on it. Let's look for a block that has a pharaoh's shoulder on it and put them together. Do they work? Um, and so they reconstructed Aten's temples and they found they're open to the sky. This is not the way Egyptian temples were built. They, they were built as, a as you go into them and there's a sloping floor up and a sloping ceiling down and you go back to this inner recess chamber, which is the Holy of Holies and it's dark and secret in there. But these temples, because they're to the Aten, the, the sun disc, they're open to the sky and light shines through them. They're like pillared colonnades. So he's building these weird temples to the Aten, and he changes his name. He's no longer going to be called Amenhotep. Amun is pleased. Now he's going to be called Akhenaten, which means well-pleasing or useful to Aten. So he's like rejected his birth god and is now going by this new god. He's 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 I'm devoting myself to this new god now. And um since he's pharaoh, he doesn't he wants everyone else to go along. So he starts depriving the temples of the traditional gods of their support. Um and that's not going to make anybody happy <laughs> or very few people happy. It's certainly not going to make the priests of Amun happy, chief deity. He's even a solar deity. Amun is a solar deity, but no, he's not the right solar deity. It has to be Aten, the sun disk. Right. And so um, so they're not happy. Lots of other people are not happy. Uh, we even have a stella that's a kind of a monument from after Akhenaten's time that talks about when Akhenaten was reigning, none of the none of the gods would answer. If you prayed to a god or goddess, they wouldn't answer you because people weren't worshiping them. And so people were privately praying to the traditional gods and privately worshiping them, but they were being deprived of their traditional worship in the Egyptian temples. And so that was one of the reasons, according to the ancient Egyptians, things were going bad because we're getting away from the way the religion is done and the gods are not happy and they're not blessing us. So um, that's one of the things that started changing. Also, um, uh, Akhenaten had... In year four or five, he celebrated what's called the Hebsed Festival. This was a festival that often, uh, theoretically, it was done for for the thirtieth year that uh, a king had been reigning. Because after a king has been reigning thirty years, he's an old man, and you don't. If his job is to go out and lead the armies and stuff, you want a nice, vigorous king. And so, what they would do is they'd have this Hebsed Festival where the king would be rejuvenated, and he would magically. And he would do things like wrestle with younger men. And of course, he's the king. He's going to win all the contests. <laughs> but he's like renewing his vitality by doing these things. And they would bring the statues of the gods out to infuse new life and vitality into the king. And so in year four or five, even though it's only his four or fifth year, he has not been reigning for 30 years. Akhenaten decides to have a Hebsed. And he um, one of the aspects of the Hebsed, though, is it's also sometimes thought to have been a kind of renewal ceremony for the gods. And the only god who is present in the imagery for this is Aten, none of the mm. other gods. So, so he's starting to mess with the religion. And that's so unpopular, he leaves Thebes. Likely because, I mean, it could, could different explanations. Egyptologists, you know, discuss this. Um, Thebes was infested with, uh, you know, temples to other gods that he didn't like, but also the priests of the other gods were there who didn't like what he was doing. And there may be a kind of got to get out of Thebes moment. And so he went to the desert and founded a new city called Achet Aten. Today, we call it Amarna. It's Tel El Amarna mm -hmm. today. So if you ever hear about the Amarna texts, that's from Akhenaten's city 
Achet Aten, which means the horizon of the Aten. And he says in his writings, because we have things he wrote, he says in his writings that the Aten revealed the place for the city to him. And uh, the Egyptologist Bob Breyer, and I'll be talking about him more because uh, he's got a great lecture on this. Um, <clears throat> uh, he has been there, you know, like a lot of Egyptologists, he's been to Amarna. And he says, OK, so the Egyptian word for horizon, the hieroglyph for it, is like a notch in a in a mountainscape with the sun peeking through the notch. And if you go to Amarna, there is a notch in the mountain. And on some mm. days of the year, the sun peeks through that notch. And so his theory is that's what Akhenaten saw. That's how the Aten revealed to him, this is the place for your city. When he looks at the horizon and sees the hieroglyph for horizon. Okay. And so he calls the city the horizon of Aten. And so they start building this new city and he moves all of his... A, not all, but a bunch of his high court officials to be with him, um, you know, because this is the new capital of Egypt and it's not going to be Thebes anymore. And they start building all this stuff. They start building tombs for themselves there because that's where they're going to die. That's where they're going to be buried, they think. Um, and he has the army, apparently, start defacing the temples of the traditional gods, like hacking out their names, especially Amun. He doesn't always do it to other gods, but um, Amun's name gets hacked out a lot. He's got a real vendetta hmm. against this other rival solar deity. And by the end of his reign, he's producing texts that are talking about Aten as if it's the only god. There's nobody else. It's all Aten. The other all other gods have died or something, they, or they didn't exist or something. It's all Aten now, and um, so that's why people have called him the first monotheist in history. They they've even said some of them he influenced Moses. Okay, we'll get we'll talk more about that, but <laughs> they, that's why they call him the first monotheist in history. And there is kind of, when you're reading about Akhenaten as monotheists ourselves, there's kind of a tendency to, to like the guy, you know, it's like, yay, monotheism, <laughs> but he's not worshiping the true God. He's got some of this, right? There is one God. It's over everything. It's for all people on earth. There's just one God who rules all peoples and gives all life and all that. He's right about all that. So, yay, monotheism up to that point, but he's misidentified it as the sun. Right. And the sun, no, sorry, it's a big ball of fusing plasma. Um, even if it may be alive, <laughs> which we talked about on a few shows, according to some unusual understandings of what constitutes life. Right. Is not a God. So. Um, so we want to be a little careful about yay monotheism when we're talking about this guy. He also starts changing the art. The Amarna period art is not like other Egyptian art. And the, the artists were not, I mean, they were basically paint by numbers guys. Um, they would not have taken this initiative on their own. He told them to change the way they started, do, they were doing art. And one of the things and this is another little anecdote from Bob Breyer. Uh, in Cairo, there's a major Egyptian museum. Uh, I've been there. I've been to that museum. It's amazing. Um, but when you get to the room where that deals with the Amarna period and has all of this art, and Breyer talks about seeing little kids come into the room, and they see pictures and statues of Akhenaten, and they're weird. <laughs> and the kids have seen all the other way, all the other pharaohs are depicted. And it's like, what's wrong with him? Because he's got this elongated head and he's got these wide hips and he's not musculature. He's not muscular. And he's kind of got a little suggestion of breasts. And it's not just Akhenaten that's depicted this way. It's all the members of the royal family. Hmm. And so, um, so what is up with the weird art? And, and this is something that, uh, that Egyptologists debate. Some, some have suggested maybe 
you know, Egyptians tended to be, Egyptian pharaohs tended to be inbred. Maybe he had birth defects. And maybe he's the first pharaoh to be honest enough to let that be depicted in art. Hmm. Maybe that's why other members of the royal family are depicted the same way, because they shared the same genes. Maybe, on the other hand, it's just stylistic. Maybe he has some weird gender neutral ideology for ancient, you know, weird for ancient Egypt that he's wanting depicted in the art. So there's a debate about why does the art get so weird? Hmm. Well, so he's messed with government. He's moved the reli- he's moved the seat of government. He's messed with the religion. He's messed with the art. What more can he mess up? <laughs> How about the military? So uh, he's not interested in leading the armies to go plunder other nations. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to stay in the desert and write hymns to the Aten. And we have his hymns to the Aten because they're written on the walls of the tombs of his officials. He himself, you know, wrote this stuff. He's the chief priest of, of Aten. He's the, he's the son of Aten. He, I'm the only one who knows the Aten. So he's the Aten's living prophet. And that's what he wants to be. He doesn't want to be um, a military leader. Oh, also, by the way, with the art, we also get stuff depicted that we've never seen before in Egyptian art, like family scenes of people relaxing at home and eating hmm. and stuff like that. And his daughters, he had, uh, he had uh, more daughters than sons. His daughters, who he dotes on, get depicted, you know, and he's like fondling them on his lap and like kissing them on the lips and stuff like that. And uh, so uh, this is more just really weird stuff, but it's kind of more intimate, you know, and mm-hmm. in a weird way, kind of more realistic than previous Egyptian art had been, or that subsequent Egyptian art would be. But in any event, he's not interested in being a military leader, and, you know, power abhors a vacuum. And so when the surrounding nations notice that the Egyptian army isn't showing up to deal with business, they start to get restless. And we have this correspondence. These are the Amarna texts. We have this correspondence that was sent to and from Akhenaten by Pharaoh's officials. Some of them are written by Pharaoh himself. Um, and there it's it you're kind of watching the decline of the empire through this correspondence. You have people writing back and saying things are really going bad. Send the army, uh, they're not respecting us. They're uh, Bob Breyer mentions one, they're attacking my house. <laughs> um, you know, um, in particular, there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a petty king in Byblos. Byblos is in Lebanon. It's the same place that they make the papyrus that became books that used to make paper for books, which is why the Bible is called the Bible. It's named after Byblos. Okay. And so the king of Byblos at this time is a guy named Rib Hadad, after the god Hadad, which is another name for Baal. And um, he, more than anyone else, wrote lots of letters to Akhenat, he wrote like 60 letters hmm. over that have survived over a 17-year period. So that's like um, he's writing a letter every few months. And he's constantly complaining about stuff. He's constantly, when Akhenaten has told him to do something, he's constantly saying, sorry, it's impossible, send the army. Um, and he And he's saying, I'm your most loyal subject here. Help me out, send the army. Um, but he's apparently really annoying to Akhenaten. And eventually Akhenaten writes a letter back that we still have where he says, why is it you alone of all of my vassal kings keep writing me? <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it shows Akhenaten's lack of interest in this area. So things are going bad with the military. Well, in seven, year 17 of his reign, which is around 1335 BC, Akhenaten dies. He's no longer Pharaoh. And there's a little bit of a dispute about what happens next. Uh, we have some indication that he was succeeded by an individual named Smenchare, uh, who may have been his son or may have been his wife, Nefertiti, or may have been somebody else, and maybe didn't succeed him. Maybe he was just a co-regent, but died before Akhenaten did. So we're not really sure where Smenchari fits into this. Also, there's an indication 
that he may have been succeeded briefly by a woman named Nefer Neferaten. And the lead, best money is that's just another name for Nefertiti. Uh, his chief wife is Nefertiti. She's the one you see the famous bust of the beautiful Egyptian woman made out of like alabaster. That's her. That's that's Akhenaten's wife. And he did. We know he like gave his daughter's authority and gave his wife authority. He let Nefertiti. It's like one of his temples is like for women to worship the Aten. And Nefertiti is depicted as the chief priestess. And so her name, Nefertiti, means the beautiful one has arrived. That's what Nefer means. And so when we have this person that looks like succeeded him, a woman named Nefer Neferuaten, that would mean the most beautiful of Aten, the most beautiful one of Aten. Hmm. And it's thought that that's the same person as Nefertiti, the beautiful one has arrived. And so it looks like she may have survived Nefertiti. For a while, people thought she died earlier, but we now know she survived until at least year 16 of his reign. And it, some have supposed that she survived for like another year after him, and, and then she died too. Um, we don't really know what happened to her, but there's a mystery. One of the, king, one of the queens of this period Either Nefertiti or uh, the the successor queen, um, King Tutankhamun's wife, wrote a letter to a Hittite king after the death of her husband. And the Hittite king, his name was uh, uh, Shupiluliuma, and he was on a military campaign when he got this letter, and it blew his mind because the Hittites were the rivals to the Egyptians. They had fought all kinds of battles together. They were not allies. They were the big enemy. Um, so this is like the United States versus the Soviet Union mm -hmm. or Britain versus the Nazis. Okay? That's how they feel about each other. And King Shupiuliuma the I gets a letter from the Egyptian widow queen saying, my husband has died and I have no son. They say about you that you have had that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband. I am afraid. Hmm. Wow, and that's so remarkable. whichever yeah, whichever hmm. queen wrote this was afraid and was uh what was wanting a Hittite husband to become the new Pharaoh. Um, and it was, it's an amazing story. We're going to talk about it more in the, uh, in the episode we're going to do on the proposed murder of King Tutankhamun, mm. because it's, it, it, this might be Nefertiti writing this, but it also might be Tutankhamun's wife. And so we're going to talk about that. In any event, um, we know, regardless of what happens with Smenhare and Nefer Neferaten, um, we know that eventually there was a king who reigned for longer who was named Tutankhaten. Because, of course, dad worships the Aten. So right. he's going to name his kid Tutankhaten. Tut, image, Ankh, life, Aten, Aten. So image of the living Aten or living image of Aten. Right. That's what the kid is named. He's eight years old when he becomes pharaoh. So he's not making the decisions. There's a there's a um, a vizier who's making an adult who's making all the decisions before him. That guy is named I A Y E. I will eventually become Pharaoh himself after the death of Tutankhamun. But what happens is apparently you know nobody liked this uh, new religion stuff and all of the messing with the institutions of Egyptian society that Akhenaten has done. So now that he's dead. And now that we have this new pharaoh, Tutankhaten, it's time to go back to the way things were, back when it was successful. Right. And so under I's influence, uh, Tutankhaten changes his name to become the famous king Tutankhamun. We're going back to Amun, the chief deity we all know and love. And so that's how we got 
King Tut. And he, yeah. under his reign, he brought back all of the traditional stuff. And that was, needless to say, hugely popular. Now, there's loads of mysteries connected with King Tut. But before we do an episode on that, we should look at the mysteries regarding his dad. Hmm. Um, and we're only going to look at some of them because there's a ton. But, um, but so the, one of them is, was he deformed? Is that the reason or part of the reason for the weird art? Was he actually a monotheist? If he was a monotheist, was he the first one? Was he the first one? Some people have claimed he's the same person as Moses. Hmm. Other people have claimed he influenced Moses because Moses lived later and also came from Egypt. Um, he, it's claimed that Akhenaten influenced the Bible. And it's claimed by some that his body, even though we have lots of mummies of pharaohs, his body disappeared. Okay. So those are the claims. Counterclaims. Well, he wasn't deformed. He wasn't a monotheist, even though he did favor one god. Uh, he wasn't the first monotheist. He wasn't Moses. He didn't influence Moses. He didn't, didn't influence the Bible. And his body has not disappeared. We have it. Okay. Those are the counterclaims. All right. So. <clears throat> From the reason perspective, let's deal with the body first. We pretty much know which mummy is his. It's a body that was found in King's it, in a in a tomb known as KV fifty five. KV stands for King's Valley. This is a place that during this period they buried the pharaohs. In the old kingdom, they had buried pharaohs in pyramids. Right, right, yes. and yeah, yeah, we exactly. talked about that. Yep. Right, in our pyramids episode. So um, then, and they wanted these tombs to last for eternity. So they gave, you know, people all the stuff that they would need in the next life. And um, and they put magical spells, you know, to help them in the afterlife and stuff. Um, well, eventually they, although those aren't in the, the Giza pyramids, um, they then discovered that if you don't want the tomb robbed, probably don't build a huge, enormous <laughs> monument on the top of it. Right. Here, here yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, because what happened during the intermediate periods, especially, is people would get into the into the pyramids and get the stuff out of because it was chaotic time. They wanted to survive. Mm -hmm. um, all and so they switched to this valley that happens to have a, a pyramid like hill or mountain on top of it. So there's a little visual connection there, mm -hmm. but it's called the King's Valley because that's where the kings. And their queens and some of their nobles got buried. And uh, the tombs are all numbered there. Archaeologists have given them these numbers. One of them is the 55th tomb that they excavated. And so it's called KV-55. And when they excavated it, they found that it had objects and connected with it that had names on them that had been defaced. Mm. And this is one of the things that happened to Akhenaten's monuments after he died, because people didn't like him. And so they subjected him to what was called damnatio memorare, or the condemnation of memory, um, where and they would like go and hack out his name. Sometimes they would write another pharaoh's name on top of it to give that pharaoh credit for something Akhenaten had actually done. Um, but they would hack out his name because they didn't like him. And uh, some of these objects in KV-55 have uh, seem to have Akhenaten's name hacked out, and they also missed Akhenaten's name hmm. in a couple of cases. And they also had uh, objects here that referred to um, Akhenaten's chief queen, Queen Tia, were here. And it like it looked like she had been buried in this tomb, along with a male mummy that was still there. And there's there are also indications that um, that King Tut was the one who did the burial. They found indications with his name and so forth. So it looks like what happened is even though Akhenaten had prepared a tomb for himself at Amarna, at, he either wasn't buried there or when he was buried there. King Tut, under the influence of I, 
decided to move him back to the Valley of the Kings where all the other kings were being buried and um, possibly to keep his Amarna tomb from being robbed and defaced because they had police that would monitor the King's Valley to keep people from robbing it, hopefully, till mm -hmm. the next intermediate period. Right. And, um, and so uh, it looks like uh, King Tut had Akhenaten and Queen Tia, his mother, buried in KV-55. Then, like 200 years later, other workmen in the King's Valley opened the tomb, took Queen Tia out and reburied her to get her away from that nasty Akhenaten, and put her in another tomb, which happens to be KV-35. Okay. And then while they're there, they deface Akhenaten stuff. But they, they there's some magical objects. There are these bricks that they had. There's like four bricks that uh that were there to to help Akhenaten in the afterlife. And they defaced his name on some of them, but they like missed it. Okay. And so some of the magical objects have his name. And they were carrying so, a grudge hundreds of years later. Still. Oh yeah. Yeah, they wiped out this whole period in Egyptian history. It was it would have been unknown. Like uh, to later pharaohs, they would have not even heard of hmm. Akhenaten, interesting, um, or his immediate successors, King Tut and I, because their memories got wiped out later too. But um, what can we say about the mummy? Well, the surrounding evidence would point to it being Akhenaten. So does the DNA. There's mm. been DNA testing on it, and it appears to be – now, this is hotly disputed. Uh, Egyptologists are kind of divided into two camps. Some of them think, oh, yeah, we, can, we have the tech now to do DNA tests on mummies this old. Others say, oh, no way. The DNA degrades too much. There's no way you can get testable DNA from these mummies. The problem is the two schools are not talking to each other right now. They don't read each other's papers. They don't go to each other's conferences. But the people who are pro-mummy DNA testing have tested the mummy, and they found that it is the son, according to them, according to their tests, mm -hmm. it is the son of Amenhotep III, and it is the father of King Tutankhamun. That would make it Akhenaten. For a while, some people said, oh, it might be Smenhare, but, um, you know, someone else who's closely related. But it seems to be the father, the son of one and the father of the other, and that would make it Akhenaten. So it, we do pretty much know who the body is at this point. Okay. So his body has survived. Is it deformed? Yes. Hmm. But not to the extent that it's shown in the Amarna period art. So it looks like, yeah, he, he did have, he did look weird as a person, but he allowed his artists, or maybe even told his artists to exaggerate that. <clears throat> Interesting. Possibly as part of his androgynous, proto-feminist, for ancient Egypt, proto-feminist um, ideology. Hmm. Um, so that's, that seemed, there seemed to be more than just the physical factors affecting the art. Was he Moses? No, he was not Moses. This is a claim that is made only by cranks. There is no evidence <laughs> that Moses was Akhenat. Um, there are kind of parallel phenomena that Egyptologists and biblical scholars are aware of. Egyptologists call it call their version of the phenomenon Egyptomania, mm -hmm. where people have you know Egypt's this exotic mysterious thing, and so people develop crazy theories that are way out of line with the evidence about Egypt. You know, like, aliens built the pyramids. <laughs> and stuff pyramids like that. are ancient alien landing platforms. Yes. Yeah, with all you know due deference to Dr. Daniel Jackson, <laughs> um, the uh, the biblical equivalent is the same sort of thing, bibliomania, where you know, people will will come up with crazy theories about the Bible that are just way out of line with the evidence. Well, this is a kind of fusion of the two. This is Egypto bibliomania, where you take the famous Egyptian monotheist figure and the famous biblical monotheist figure and put them together. But there's no evidence for that. No right. serious Egyptologist or biblical scholar takes this claim seriously. Okay. What about the claim that he was what about the so what about the claim he was a monotheist 
that actually seems to be that Akhenaten was. That seems to be accurate. Um, not necessarily at the beginning mm -hmm. of his reign, but by the end of it, he is talking as if there's only the Aten, and he's progressively stripped uh, the image of the god of any associations with like human form or animal form. It's no longer depicted as Horus, you know, the falcon headed god. Right. Um, it's just the disc. Um, even though there was kind of an identification with Ray and Otten, now we're just looking at the disc and we see like it's rays coming out of it with little hands and they'll the hand will be holding an ankh up to a picture of the Pharaoh. It's like the Otten is giving Pharaoh life and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have this progressive abstraction of the deity. He would not, though, have been the first monotheist. Um, when we talk about monotheism, we don't mean there's only one being in the, in the spiritual world. I mean, God has his angels and things like that. They're lesser beings. But there's one great being who's the creator of everything else. And that idea is not something that uh, would have been the first first thought of by Akhenaten. That's that's going to have been invented multiple times in human history, including in cases where people didn't just think of it on their own, but God revealed it to them. Right. And that's actually the original, according to the Bible, that's the original state of mankind, that God revealed himself to mankind in the beginning. And then polytheism arose later. And, um, and you know, we know that monotheism has been in if you want to say invented or revealed or whatever, periodically under God's providence, different people have adopted monotheism, including some of the Greek philosophers and people in other cultures. Um, the the um, the uh, Zoroastrians are monotheists, for example. Uh, there are versions of Hinduism that are monotheistic, where they see all of the gods as just aspects of one god. So. This is not going to be, he's not going to yeah. be the first. He may be the first major one in recorded history. We could say that there, these, these different peoples of different religions are getting a glimpse into the reality that underlies w their, their own religion. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, so this kind of brings us to the more faith perspective, uh, where we get into more direct claims about Moses in the Bible. Could Akhenaten have influenced Moses and, you know, maybe... Moses, you know, knew about monotheism from this source. Well, um, okay, maybe, but that's going to depend on the date of when Moses lived. Mm -hmm. So we know really well when, or within a few years at least, when Akhenaten lived. He was in like the 1350s and 1340s BC. Yeah. When did Moses live? There is a debate about this. Hmm. Biblical scholars are not certain. Uh, the traditional theory is that the Exodus occurred around the year 1446 BC. So that would be a hundred years before the time of Akhenaten. And obviously, in that case, Akhenaten could not influence Moses. If anything, it would have been the other way around. Hmm. Uh, Moses would have influenced Akhenaten. On the other hand, um, Another argument has been made, and this, frankly, is the more popular one among modern scholars today. Um, another argument has been made that the Exodus would have occurred, and therefore Moses lived around 1250 BC, which would be about 100 years after Akhenaten. Now, at some point, we may do uh, a show dealing more particularly with the dating of the Exodus. Here, I'm not going to try to draw a conclusion about which dating for the Exodus is right. But obviously, if the traditional earlier dating is right, Akhenaten couldn't have influenced Moses. If the later dating is right, well, okay, maybe he could have. Obviously, he didn't. I mean, may, Moses might have grown up. It's not that long after Akhenaten. Maybe mm -hmm. Moses, who's raised in Pharaoh's court, maybe he grew up hearing legends about the heretic monotheist Pharaoh. But he didn't conclude it was the Aten. He concluded it right. was a different God who made the sun and is not the sun and is named Yahweh. Right. So even if even if he had some early influence, it's not it's not the principal source of Moses's information about God. 
Moses's principal source of information about God is God himself, because right. he appeared and talked to Moses. Right. So the evidence, I mean, even if you're not a Christian or a Jew, you can say, okay, well, this is the evidence we have. It suggests that Moses certainly thought a God was appearing to him. And if from a faith perspective, if you're a Jew or a Christian, you say, yep, he did. And I would argue as an apologist, we have evidence that points to that. Right. But, um, but uh, the evidence we have does not suggest that Moses was heavily influenced by Otanism because if he had, he would have been an Otanist and he wasn't. Right. Could Akhenaten have had another influence on the Bible? Maybe. Hmm. One of the things you find if you read the writings on the tomb walls at Amarna is you find these hymns to the Aten. The longest version is on the tomb of I, who later became Pharaoh and was buried elsewhere. But in the tomb he was getting ready for himself, which is what you did. You built your tomb before you died. You didn't yep. leave it to your relatives. Um, in the tomb that he was getting ready for himself at Amarna, he has the longest version of a hymn to the Ot, and it's called the Great Hymn to the Ot. And if you read it, and if you read an older translation of it that uses kind of King james archaic language, and if you put it next to Psalm 104, they sound similar. Hmm. And so there have been biblical scholars who have, who have proposed the idea, maybe Psalm 104 is somehow based on the great hymn to the Ot, because it talks about things, you know, the sun rises over everything, it gives light to everything, the lions come out of their caves and they roar for their prey and they slink back to their caves when it goes down and man comes out and man lays down like in death when the sun goes down. And you find these common ideas in both of these hymns. Well, one of the things we know about the authors of the Hebrew Bible is they didn't like paganism. But that didn't stop them from appropriating pagan writing to subvert it. Hmm. So one of the things you find, and we'll can talk about this in a future episode on Genesis. One of the things you find when it's it's kind of like when remember when uh Merib Baal gets called Merib Bosheth to mm -hmm. shame Baal, get rid of that Baal in there. Um something similar happens uh with Canaanite legends because the Canaanites they worshiped Baal and they had this legend for example of Baal defeated Yam or Yam. Yam was the sea god. Okay. He was depicted sometimes as a serpent. And because, uh, you know, serpents twist kind of like the waves. And so ya Baal had a confrontation with Yam. He defeated Yam. He put Yam in his place and he ruled over it. Well, guess what? You find in the Bible passages that say Yahweh determined the limits of Yam. And Yahweh triumphed over the watery chaos monsters and things like that. And it looks like what the biblical authors are doing is saying, no, 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 no. Don't think that was Baal. Mm -hmm. It was Yahweh who determined where the sea is and where its limits are, where the shoreline is. Yahweh is in control of all that, not Baal. And you see the same thing happening in Genesis in various places where as God is setting up the world, if you know the pagan background, um, you see what the author's really doing is subverting it, saying, oh, no, 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 the sun and the moon, Yahweh made those. They're not gods. They're just lights. Hmm. Or the great, the great flood, no, 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 no. It didn't come because man was making too much noise at night and keeping the gods awake and they got annoyed. It was because man was wicked and it was a just punishment. Right. So you see the biblical authors doing this. Could they have been aware of the great hymn to the Aten and said, hey, that expresses some really beautiful poetic thoughts, but it's naming the wrong God. We just need to adjust it. So these accurate praises are accurately directed to the God to whom they belong. Possible. Hmm. The question is, would they have been aware? Because Psalm 104 is written much later. Yeah. Amarna was a was an abandoned city. And nobody was there reading the great hymn to the Aten from Israel off the wall of King I's uh, tomb. 
Um, and we don't have good evidence that the hymn was passed down in other places. We don't find it on the walls of other tombs or temples. So it looks like this is, even though there are some similarities here, it looks like the similarities, and, and there could be a remote connection. You know, it's possible. Mm -hmm. But but um, it doesn't look like there's, there's any direct connection. It looks more like this is standard solar imagery that you would come up with whenever you're talking about the sun, which is over everything, or when you're talking about the true God, which is over everything. Yeah, the lions are going to come out and they're going to roar for their prey and they're going to slink back home and man is going to come out and go back home and all that stuff. Anytime you're talking about a universal deity, whether it's the sun or something else, you could come up with this kind of this kind of imagery. So it's not at all clear that even indirectly, Akhenaten had an influence on the Bible, although it's possible okay. indirectly. Wow. Okay. So um, what is your bottom line then on these mysteries surrounding uh, Akhen Akhenaten? Well, um, the bottom line is Akhenaten, for me, he's a very mysterious and fascinating figure. He's very fun to read about. Uh, we may never figure out everything, but we are making progress with some of the mysteries. Like we now really pretty much know whose mummy he is. Mm -hmm. um, and despite all that, he didn't play a significant role with respect to the Bible. Okay. But maybe a little one. Maybe a little one. And we'll be coming back and we'll do to this period of Egypt. And when we, like you said, we talk about uh, yeah. King Tut. And uh, I'm and... looking forward to the murder of King Tut. <laughs> uh, re recently, we polled our patrons uh, of what do you want to have come up. And I was hoping King Tut's murder would come up number one next because I'd love to do it soon. But it looks like a, a different topic is being selected. So we'll do that one, but we'll still do King Tut's murder. Yes. Yes, we'll all whatever. Whenever we pull our patrons, um, what the one will rise to the top, and we'll choose to do that one next first. First, but the others will still stay on the list. We'll still we'll get, get to, to them eventually. Yeah. So, uh, so what kind of resources can people look to to find out more about Akhenaten? Okay, so um, I've got a number of links to Wikipedia. One of them is to Akhenaten's own page. Another is to the Amarna period itself. Uh, there you'll also find there because um, the Amarna period really goes a little bit beyond Akhenaten himself. Um, it, it, the other period, the other people who were connected with him are, are kind of roped into this period somewhat. Um, you can also look at links to the Amarna art um, through Wikipedia. Also have one on Akhenaten's mummy, the KV-55 mummy. Mm. And so you can go through the evidence that they have there dealing with it. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the people I mentioned earlier in the show is a professor named Bob Breyer. He did, he's done a few courses for the teaching company. They make the great courses mm -hmm. and his are great. He is a wonderful teacher and he has a, he has a couple that deal with the pharaohs. He's also got one on hieroglyphics, but I've got a link to his course, the history of ancient Egypt. Mm. It's available. Now, sometimes teaching company courses can be kind of expensive. This is an audible.com version that's owned by Amazon, so it's much more affordable. Okay. But and, and it's been out a number of years, so they've released it in the audible format. Um, it's a 48 uh, lecture course, and it's wonderful. I've listened to it many times, and he's got uh, marvelous lectures on Akhenaten and King Tut and the murder theory of King Tut and all that stuff. Um, he also has a shorter lecture series called The Great Pharaohs, which is basically excerpted from the bigger course. And one of the lectures in that is on Akhenaten, but it's the same lecture. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a book called by James K. Hoffmeyer called Akhenaten and the Origins of Monotheism. And this is a scholarly level book. I mean, you can read it if you're not if you're not a scholar. It's it, you know, he translates the stuff for you. But um this is a scholarly level book that looks at the relationship between the Amarna period and the Bible. And it's another fascinating read, and he's very balanced and moderate. He does not go into um, he does not go into uh, crazy theories, but he does talk about you know the evidence. Okay, so what's the evidence regarding how could Akhenaten have been an influence on Moses or on Psalm one hundred four? Let's dig into the evidence for that and see what conclusions arise. So that's a good book to check for that. Finally, uh, have a link to an article regarding the DNA debate among Egyptologists, the yes, it can work or no, it can't work. And so you can read all about that there. Excellent. Wow. Very good. 
So uh, as we wrap up that topic, let's talk some of, about some of our mysterious feedback that we've been getting from folks. Uh, some great stuff to, to talk about. Um, on the episode about Bob Lazar, where we, we talked about Bob Lazar in Area 51, um, I Kung Fu You Too on YouTube says, uh, I saw the Lazar documentary and liked it, but it did seem to skip a few key points. I would have asked, hey, can I see the paper copies of your MIT degrees? I have my college degrees framed in on my wall. Yeah, this is one of the things that I wish the documentary had gone into. Um, Bob Lazar claims to have you know, graduated from MIT and um, I, Caltech as well. And, and then he claims that he, the government disappeared all the records. It would be really hard to do. Um, I, I know I still have stuff from college, including mm -hmm. my diplomas. So where's Bob's? I guess he could say um, they disappeared those as well. They broke into my house and stole them I or guess. something. Yeah. Um, but it would be really hard for them to disappear all of the yearbooks that are out right. there in private hands. And so that's the the bit of college evidence that I focused more on in the episode, because that's harder to disappear than just a single copy of a diploma off someone's wall. But it is a yeah. question that should be asked of Lazar. Or the photos that your college uh, friends took of you at the college. At college <laughs> or in the college newspaper or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, that would be very hard to do. Or all of the dorm phone books from back then. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Rick from Facebook uh, writes, as much as I want to believe Lazar's story, it all comes down to integrity. Having a government clearance implies and insists on the ability to keep a secret and not disclose what you've learned. The fact that Lazar went public with his secrets destroys any and all credibility he may have. I understand that reaction, Rick. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not, I, I don't personally go that far. Uh, it, it does damage his credibility, but I think there are situations where you have government leakers, and if you are thinking your life may be in danger, that might be a mm -hmm. time you want to leak to make yourself too public to kill. Right. And Lazar has hinted that that played a role in his revelations, that he only decided to go public in, or that he decided to go public in part to protect himself. Right. So, you know, I wouldn't entirely write off what he says as a leaker because we do know leakers occur in other situations. And if his other claims were true, this would be a plausible leaking situation, but you're right. He does take a credibility hit. Right. Or if, if someone leaks because they have, feel like they have a uh, moral or ethical obligation to do so like yeah. a, as a whistleblower. Yeah. yeah. Edward so. Snowden would be an example of that. Yeah. Uh, so and then Francesco from Facebook says uh, again about the Bob Lazar episode, if all of this is true, would that mean Christianity is not? I'm confused. No, we, we covered that in the episode itself. So Lazar made some claims, not that he had personal knowledge of, but that he had been told or read in briefing documents that suggested aliens had been involved in guiding human history genetically and and that they ha seemed seemed maybe to have some kind of interest in our souls or something regardless of whatever he may and he didn't even say this is true he just said this is stuff that i heard and and so forth and it could have been feeding me disinformation so even he's not claiming it's true even if it were true it wouldn't mean christianity is false um like we said in the episode uh the bible reveals that god made man but it doesn't reveal the details of how he did that um we've had people even we have uh, you know people today uh, making minor genetic therapy changes and stuff. And and for future humans, well, other humans may have been involved in, in their history. Uh, if aliens had a little role too, okay, well, God's still in control of the overall process. Christianity is still true. It's still grounded in objective evidence. Personally, I don't think Bob Lazar's claims are true. As I said in the episode, I think he is in he, where he, while he might have worked at Area 51 for a while, might, um, I think he's hoaxing fundamentally. Okay. Either that or he's being fed disinformation. Right. Um, and so I don't think those documents he claims to have read have any credibility. But even if they did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't disprove Christianity. Okay. So uh, th thank you, everyone, for your feedback. We, we really appreciate it. We love getting it. Um, we love discussing it. And so continue to keep it coming. 
Uh, Jimmy, what do you have for headlines, mysterious headlines this week? So I have uh, several interesting stories. One of them deals with a later pharaoh, Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Um, Cleopatra famously was the lover of Mark Anthony after she had been the lover of Julius Caesar. And uh, she and Mark Anthony committed suicide, but we haven't known where they were buried until now. Mm. Uh, Egyptologists think they have found, they haven't found the exact tomb yet. But they think they found the general site of where Anthony and Cleopatra are buried. And so there's a link to a story about that. Also, while we're talking about human ancestry, I've got a story about an AI that uh, has found evidence in the human genome of a third human subspecies in our ancestry. So we've already found evidence genetically that we have um, uh, interbred with Neanderthals mm -hmm. and another group called the Denisovians. Um, they're both other human subspecies that our subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens, um, has interbred with in the past. They're not around anymore. We won. Sorry. <laughs> um, the it, but now uh, an AI doing kind of deep learning processing of human genetic information found in the genome another evidence of another crossbreeding with another uh, subspecies that looks like it was a hybrid of the Neanderthals and the Denisovians. So so, so they interbred. And then... They interbred, and then we interbred with the interbreeder, or <laughs> interbreed product. So a lot of inbreeding going on here between these subspecies. Yes, that sounds like a episode of uh, Prehistoric The Bachelor. <laughs> yeah, I'll take your word. I haven't seen that. <laughs> I haven't either. Um, I'm just speculating. <laughs> okay. Um, then finally, I have a video on YouTube of a Bigfoot hunt in Provo, Utah. Mm where these guys were out in front of their house. It's snowy. They live in the mountains in Provo, and they see something up on, on the mountain opposite their house that looks like a Bigfoot, and they get it on, on their phone. And then they go hunting for it. And so you can watch them. They talk about it as they're doing it, as they're climbing up the mountain, looking for the footprints and stuff like that. It's a fascinating thing. They ultimately... Uh, ultimately, you know, it doesn't pan out. They don't find strong evidence of a Bigfoot. Um, mm -hmm. And even they conclude they don't, in in the end, they don't think that's what they saw. But what's refreshing about it is seeing them do it and seeing how they're being reasonable as hmm. they're doing it. They're not closed to the possibility, but they're not just, oh, that absolutely has to be Bigfoot, right. no matter what we find. And so um, it's really nice to see a, uh, a reasonable group of people exploring something like this. It's not that long of a watch. There's also a link to an article about the Bigfoot hunt that has some more information. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, that link also has information about how to take a proper Bigfoot video <laughs> yeah. with a tripod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, turn your camera horizontal. Do yeah. not turn it vertical. That will degrade the amount of data you get. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. In fact, just take the horizontal video for everything, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks, Jimmy. That's great. Uh, so as we close, close things out again uh, this month uh, with another set of uh, four wonderful episodes, and we've got more coming up next month, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be letting you know what those uh, topics are going to be online. In, in, including our next episode is going to be our first patron's choice episode. Yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, but we, we, I try to put up a teaser on our Facebook page every month of what next month's episodes are going to be about. So, uh, you know, that's another reason to check, check out the, the, the Facebook page. So uh, before we do that, I want to thank our patrons um, who make the show possible, not just for selecting the, uh, the, the next topic, but, but for your financial support. Um, and I want to thank by name this week. I want to thank Andrew G, Ricardo G, John S, Steve N and Benjamin B through their generous donations. And those of all of our patrons, at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows we do at sqpn.com. And you could join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of this mystery surrounding Egypt's heretic pharaoh? Um, let us know by going to sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page 
leave some feedback on the show there, or send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. You uh, Please remember to like this episode on the Mysterious World Facebook page, retweet it on Twitter, uh, p- subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube where you should hit the bell to get notifications. You can uh, find the relevant links like we discussed the, for the feedback, I'm sorry, for the resources uh, from our discussion and links to the Mysterious Headlines to our uh, on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.